The chapter on sexuality and gender is the worst chapter by far in this book. There's no question about it. It doesn't do what it should do in terms of teaching students um, about human sexuality or uh, even those who study human sexuality as their jobs. Um, sexologists and um, experimental psychologists who study human sex behavior. It is um, rift with unsubstantiated facts. I'm not going to teach it. I'm not going to have you learn it. I do teach a class on human sexuality where I picked a book that has a good scientific view on teaching students the history, the biology, the anatomy, the psychology of human sexuality, but we're not going to do it here. We're going to move on to personality. Unfortunately, the personality chapter is not that much better. So. I apologize. Um, it starts off talking about Freud and personality when Freud was really talking about psychopathology and the psyche or the self. He wasn't too much interested in personality so much as he was interested in individual characteristics and experiences that happened to us when we were children and how that affected our adult lives. Um, but Freud's theory, his sort of model of the self, is a very interesting one. He used the words, the uh, Latin words, id, ego, and superego. Um, and the id uh, is his concept of the base level biological functioning. Remember when we talked about motivation, sort of the hypothalamic functioning of food, water, safety, sex, those things are um, what our id has us seek or drives us towards behaviors associated with satisfying those urges, desires, drives, motivations. The id is a base level human functioning. However, in order to function in society, you can't just drink whatever you want, eat whatever you want, have sex with whomever you want. We have to control those things. And so uh, he talks about the super ego as um, the the functions inside your mind which are you know knowing that society doesn't accept things that it's immoral that it's illegal that it's unethical that it's against your parents wishes or your religious values that's the super ego so on one side you have this driving force of biological imperatives towards selfish uh, banal uh, I'm, it's early in the morning and I'm lacking words, hedonistic activities, the id. And then you've got your sort of well put together puritanical um, mom, strict school marms, um, sort of pressing in on both sides. And in the center is you, the ego. The ego is the self. It's your perception of yourself. And it's who decides between which one, right? Uh, there's a big bowl of ice cream waiting in in the freezer for me and and my id just goes oh sugary goodness chocolatey great I have um, Tillamook mint chocolate chip ice cream in there it's unbelievable uh, one of the best ice creams ever and I'm I'm a connoisseur of, of helado so id says go eat all that ice cream my super ego says it's 8 30 in the morning uh, James, what are you doing? No, we don't eat ice cream at 8.30 in the morning. The id says, but it's tasty and good. The superego says, you'll get fat. The id says, you'll like it. It will feel good right now. Superego says, it won't be good for later. So, what does the ego do? Who does the ego listen to? The devil on the shoulder or the angel on the shoulder? The id is there for a reason. It drives us towards things that are good for us. The superego is there for a reason. It, it is a safety mechanism. It keeps us uh, in good stead with those around us. It keeps us sociable. Um, if you see people acting only on their id status, uh, then you're really gonna find most people who have violated social norms and probably are in jail. So, 
Got to watch out for the id, can't listen to it solely. But also, you don't want to be dominated by this superego. You're going to need to find times to vacillate. You know what? Sometimes I eat ice cream in the morning. How about that? I don't remember the last time. But it's not out, out of question. Uh, superego usually says, James, don't eat ice cream in the morning. Eat some fruit or yogurt or granola or something healthy for you, right? Drink some orange juice. Get some coffee. Start your day right. But sometimes I eat ice cream in the morning. And so the id sometimes has its sway. The ego sometimes agrees with the id. The ego sometimes, most of the time in my case, agrees with the super ego. And I think those are good poles to have is that we have competing interests and that the, the person we are has to decide about it. Okay, so that's the first thing we talk about is Freud's theory on the self. It's not necessarily personality though. So I know this is the personality chapter. And again, this is just, a, it's just a, it's, it talks about uh, a, a person who's intersex. Whereas that seems like it would have been a really good example story for somebody uh, who's intersex and was dealing with issues of they were told that they were female their whole life and yet they really felt male. That sounds like a great example story for the sexuality and gender chapter. That's not the example in the sexuality and gender chapter. That's the example in the personality. <sighs> anyway. You can tell I don't like these two chapters in the book, but whatever, I think personality is extremely interesting and it's something that psychologists have been studying for basically the length of uh, the discipline. And it's really interesting because it's probably under, it, it, it's less understood by the general public. Personality theory and personality traits is less understood by the general public than almost everything else in this class. And it's also very predictive of outcomes. Personality, if you do personality assessment on someone, you are extremely good at predicting the outcomes of their behaviors later on. And so I do want you to become aware of, of personality and its usefulness in clinical settings and in other settings as well. So I'm gonna skip over Freud's psychosexual stages of development also, which would have been great in the developmental chapter which may have been okay in the human sexuality and gender chapter. Not really good for the personality chapter, but again, Dr. Licht, I'm calling you out. Fix these two chapters. Personality is basically one's style for interacting with or perceiving the world. It's unique to each individual, but we've gone about classifying it within certain parameters and we'll describe those personality characteristics and traits in a bit. You have a unique personality that is probably mostly based or designed by or created or evolved from groups of people who because of those certain personality characteristics thrived in whatever environment they were in. And so there's an evolutionary nature to these types of personality characteristics within the ultra-social species of humans. I have a unique personality. It's completely separate from, say, my wife. Uh, if we took personality tests, you'd see that we score vastly differently on many of the key areas. But I love her and I'm committed to her and I'm not going anywhere. She's great, she's the best thing in my life. But we're extremely different personality wise. Certain personality characteristics enable people to predict actual outcomes in relational capacities. Now this is a dangerous one because again, it's kind of like power in the hands of certain people is dangerous. It, if you use the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator, you can predict the longevity of relationships between two people. It turns out that there are patterns of people who are attracted to one another for relationships, but then don't remain committed based on a, a particular orientation of their personality types. Now, if you consider personality to be immutable, 
like it's um, you know your intelligence. You're born with a certain level or capacity for learning, and that's it. Uh, you can't really improve it. You could practice certain things. You can't really improve your personality. If you if you look back to Freud's superego, you can have predilections or personality characteristics that move you towards a certain behavior, but you might say to yourself, you know what, if I do that, then I get this reaction from other people. I don't want that other reaction, so I'm going to mitigate my behavior by altering it, even though I know that my initial reaction from a behavioral personality standpoint is to, is to, is to go one direction. I'm going to go a different one. Diversity of personalities is very important because different personalities give us different perspectives and together and formed in a group we can benefit one another with each different type. If you look at any of these sort of archetypal groups, right, the X-Men or um, the Fantastic Four, I don't know if you guys are old enough to know that one, uh, maybe they'll come out with a movie, or maybe they already have, Marvel probably came out with one. You know the the Avengers, these archetypal groups. What you'll see is that each of the different characters is embodying a particular caricature of a personality type. But each of those ends up being useful for the group. So again, it's not like there's some sort of perfect personality. Just like there's not some sort of perfect IQ that we want everybody to have a higher IQ. That's we've gone over that. That's not what we want. We don't want everybody to have a perfectly neutral um, neurotic personality or a, a perfectly moderate level of agreeableness. You don't want the middleness. Um, what you want is the group of people to have differences and then them to commit to uh, particular boundaries for their behaviors, that's what we call governance, that we agree upon and elevate above our individual selves. That's the best option. Part of this chapter about Freud's work that is important, and that is ego defense mechanisms. The great Carrie Yules in The Princess Bride once said, Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who tells you different is trying to sell you something. And never was a truer statement said in a, in a funny comedy like The Princess Bride, but except for the whole land war in Asia thing. We get hurt by things in life. Things offend us. You feel oppressed or are a victim. You think you are. What you do about that is really the important thing. You're gonna be a victim. You're gonna be oppressed. You're gonna be opposed. Something's going to happen that's going to upset you. How do you handle it? That's where Freud was very helpful in helping us understand what are called ego defense mechanisms. We have this ego in our, our self and we want to keep it so uh, intact. We don't want things to challenge it. Oh my goodness. Sorry, I'm being challenged right now. They're spraying chemicals uh, in the back of our house. Sorry, they're coming around to check the gas meter right now. Who is? The PG&E, I'm guessing. Oh man, they're also... Alright, let's try and talk about ego defense mechanisms again. I was interrupted that last time, but that inevitably happens here at home. So ego defense mechanisms are what Freud says help us to keep integrity in what our ego is. Um, there are things like sublimation, which says you basically do the right thing instead of doing the wrong thing. You know. Uh, instead of canceling watching my video right now and going, you know, finding somebody to Netflix and chill with, you're, what your id wants you to do, your superego says, no, you must do everything right. Your ego might say, let's sublimate that and say, I'm going to do this for now and do that later. Sort of plan out how you're going to fulfill both needs. Other classic forms of ego defense mechanisms is displacement where you might uh, be upset about something you know unrequited love missed opportunities but then instead of being mad at the person that rejected your love or the opportunity that rejected you you start to reject somebody else because you're upset that you were rejected that's displacement you're displacing your own hurt for yourself onto somebody else who did, wasn't the one that inflicted that type of pain. 
there's repression and repression is where you actively seek to avoid thinking about the fact that you got rejected in love or rejected for an opportunity, right? That that hurt that you experienced is uh, so painful to who you are and how you view yourself that you avoid thinking about it, you repress it. Uh, there's rationalization, which is, um, wow, well, you know, I, uh, I was rejected, but you know, everyone gets rejected. So I'll just rationalize that. There is projection, which says, I reject them because they're, they're bad. Um, it's not me that wasn't bad. It's not me that should have been rejected. It was them that should have been rejected. That's another way that our ego sort of defends itself and the integrity that we have. And, and it's a way, these ego defense mechanisms are a way of pushing off uh, the sense that there's an external locus of control. And that external locus of control really talks about feeling that your sense of efficacy in the world is minimal and that life is just happening to you. You don't have an actual means of changing any of your circumstances. Whereas if you have an internal locus of control, you say, I am a part of the rejection that happened to me. I am responsible for part of that rejection and I need to analyze what it was, what were my failures in this relationship, in this job opportunity, where did I go wrong so that I can correct myself to get the outcome that I desire in the next iteration of this particular game. There is flat out denial. I wasn't rejected. She'll come back to me or I'll get that job someday. There's that type of uh, ego defense mechanism too, but that's um, usually one that's short-lived uh, and then we move on to other ones. So those are ego defense mechanisms and that's what Freud talked about, uh, how people deal with the problems uh, in, in their own failings. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is birth order. Birth order is one of the fun areas of psychology that people have tried to study and have tried to keep tried to keep it as scientific as possible but it just it lends itself to anecdotal evidence of well I'm a firstborn or I'm the baby of the family or I'm a middle child and uh, or I'm an only child right these these birth order typical stereotypes that we have about people we have a real tendency to make confirmation bias where you know I'll see my wife do something definitive and she won't listen for my input and I'll go firstborn you're a firstborn we shouldn't do it that way we should do it another way and she could say to me well you're you're, a, you're the baby of the family you're the you're the youngest these stereotypes work in anecdotes but only when we're trying to do confirmation bias there are definitely some trends in scientific literature that show some things about birth order that are important. For example, this sucks for me because I'm the baby, the oldest siblings tend to have the highest IQ. So tend to, remember that, remember this, this is a distribution here, there's variability. Everybody's different, but the population of uh, firstborn kids tend to have higher IQs than their subsequent siblings. Now many people try and understand, well what is it then that's causing that, right? Was wh What's going on? Is it that the younger born, uh, or the younger the parents, the uh, better the, the gamete cells or something? Probably not that. Although there is a real issue with aging and pregnancy and we'll talk about that if you take the human sexuality class. The idea of Context is probably more imperative in why the older siblings, the firstborns, have higher IQs than the younger siblings. It's probably because they spent much of their time with adults, and adults uh, probably made their context more um, advantageous. They also had to figure things out on their own, right? There weren't other kids, other models around that they could follow. Or, uh, like me, I could either follow my older brother's uh, example or I could diverge from it. And that was very easy for me to be successful at doing so, but he had to blaze his own trail, right? So you think about that from an older sibling standpoint, that they have to figure things out on their own. There isn't a model for them to do so. I find birth order stuff extremely fun to talk about. 
there is some interesting findings in the literature that firstborns are more successful. Like almost all presidents are firstborns. Um, so there, there's there's a some stuff that's very interesting. But you got to be careful about making causal statements of you are this way because of your birth order. I think a, an interesting thing to use birth order as is to say this may be a contributing factor given the context you were raised in of why you're experiencing this particular aspect of being. Mm, I've got three boys and they follow to a key to, 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 to the, if you, if you opened up a book on birth order and personality types, my firstborn is the leader, the rule follower, the one who identifies most with the parents. The middle one is the comforter and the, the one who makes peace. And the youngest one breaks shit and makes everyone laugh. I mean, it's absolutely spot on for what people say, but that's an anecdote. If you took somebody else's family, they might have a different situation. So just because my family and my experience with my boys confirms exactly what people who study this say will happen in these scenarios of three siblings born in a certain period of time. Oh, there's, there's other stuff that says that if you have a long break between siblings, like for example, my dad was born way after his older siblings. Uh, that he becomes like a firstborn again rather than uh, falling into the baby of the family sort of category. Uh, it has to do with time between uh, siblings. But yeah, there's, there's really interesting stuff that goes on. The University of Minnesota is where most research in personality goes on. And this is also where most of that research that comes about birth order and personality types has come from. I don't know why the... What, what's Minnesota? The Gophers? I don't know why the Gophers... I don't know why they got to to be the leaders in human in, in uh, human personality studies, but they did. So I want to talk to you about personality testing. Uh, and I started talking about University of Minnesota because the world's most famous and most ubiquitous and most well-researched, best standardized personality test is one called the Minnesota multifacet personality index or MMPI. Uh, the MMPI is a series of like 700 questions. It's like five or 700 questions. I forget how many exactly, but they're true or false questions. So it's a bi it's a, it's a binary choice. You say yes, or you say no to this statement. And the statements will be things like, I like being in nature. Now, <laughs> You might be a complicated person, you might be a disagreeable person as I am. <laughs> and so you'll, you'll read a question like, I like being in nature. And if you're a disagreeable personality characteristic like I am, you'll say, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I would love to be in nature in my backyard on the American River, you know, on a paddleboard, swimming, walking on the hiking trails with my boys. I would not like to be in the Arctic tundra right now wearing shorts and a t-shirt. So, so do I enjoy being in nature? It depends on what you mean by nature. Right? That's my disagreeable nature coming to, to, to fore here and, and, and being so ornery or questioning or skeptical or critical, however you want to describe the disagreeableness with which I am exhibiting behaviors. You could just say, well, do you like being in nature or not? True or false? I'd say true. 700 of those questions gives a lot of opportunities to see trends of people's responses to certain certain questions. Some of the questions on the Minnesota Multifacet Personality Index are very important questions, but most are only important as they're aggregated together within groups of like questions. Another cool thing about the Minnesota Multifacet personality index, the MMPI, is that it has uh, lie scales built in. So basically, if I said, I like to be in nature, if I said true to that question, but you know, 400 questions later, it says, being in nature is something I like, and I mark false, 
then what that'll indicate is that I'm not answering my questions consistently. I might be trying to sort of mess up what the test shows about my personality. I might be defensive, ego defense about somebody actually knowing what my personality is like. Most people uh, answer questions consistently across these personality assessments, but um, the MMPI has been utilized so much in so many situations. It's used in hiring. It's used in, uh, like I, when I was, um, <laughs> I, I don't think I told you this, but after college, I didn't know where I was going, didn't know what I was doing, and uh, I graduated and I applied to be in the CHP. I know, I know. But uh, I got all the way through the testing. I had an academy date here in Sacramento. I was down in Southern California when I applied, but they were gonna bring me up to West Sacramento and I was gonna go to the academy. Uh, and I had to take the MMPI uh, as a personality test because they wanna see are, the, are there people who are attempting to get into law enforcement that have personality profiles that indicate bad things about their behavior. Uh, and so many of you don't understand the screening that goes through most uh, law enforcement um, hiring processes. Now, that has changed a lot in the last, whatever, that'd be 25 years ago that that happened. So it's a long time since, since I was uh, considered a career in law enforcement. I would not have been, uh, it would have been bad for me. Although I would be retired right now, which that's kind of crazy to think about. Anyhow, the MMPI is used in court cases, it's used legally, it's used clinically, it's used educationally, uh, because it gives a good profile of characteristics of someone's personality and sort of gives you a snapshot or a sense of how is their personality in relationship to other people's personalities. And that's a nice thing about it. So MMPI is a great uh, tool. I already mentioned another test, which is, um, the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator. And that one is, uh, you may have heard people say, I'm, I'm an INFP or I'm an ENFJ. You know, these four letter distinctions. And really, I think those four letter distinctions are terrible because although you might be an I or you might be an E, you might be right on the middle or you might be an extreme E or you might be an extreme I, that's for extroverted or introverted. You might be in right in the middle. So I, I don't like the distinction of I'm an INFJ or I'm an ENFP. That those I don't, I don't think those are helpful at all. But the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator is another similar um, scenario like the MMPI where it asks you questions about what are you like. Uh, these are called self-report personality uh, tests and those are good in some senses and bad in others. Good in that they give you an accurate reflection of what the person wants to tell you at the time, but they're also fraught with the potentiality for uh, malingering. I could act like something's wrong when there's not something wrong. So those are, those are some issues with personality tests. Another one is something called a projective uh, personality assessment. Now these are far less scientifically valid, despite the fact that people have attempted to do standardizations of them. People have made scoring systems and I spent an entire semester in graduate school learning about how to grade or score Rorschach exams, something that I never did and I don't know anyone who ever does in a clinical practice. Um, I, I, I know how to score the Rorschach. I still have the little book somewhere in my storage. Uh, it's like a spiral bound book about how to score these stupid tests. Stupid tests in scoring, stupid tests in um, science, very potentially useful tests in certain clinical settings. So projective assessment of personality. Projective assessment says, look, you want to show me your personality. You just might not have the words or there might be those ego defense mechanisms that's keeping you from doing so. How do we break through that, right? Freud says that you have all this, um, all this stuff under the the iceberg an, uh, analogy of your unconscious mind, right? Your your conscious mind is just the tip of the iceberg. There's this huge amount of you that's underneath that you don't show to people. That's that's hidden, so to speak. And so, 
how do I get to that? And if I'm a clinician and I want to use a projective assessment test, that is going to bypass some of your ego defense mechanisms that makes you not want to share with me, the clinician, what it's like. And so one of these tests is the thematic apperception test. It was developed by Murray in the 30s. And it's a really cool test because to me, it's, it's helpful. The TAT, as it's known, is it shows pictures and it shows scenarios uh, and it asks the person to tell a story. And I like that because look, we are storied creatures. Uh, our consciousness is a narrative. The story we tell ourselves about ourselves. And so this thematic apperception test shows you a picture and says, tell a story with the beginning, middle and end about this picture. And the pictures that are on there are wonderfully ambiguous. That's another thing about projective assessments of personalities that you can't just give somebody something that is you know, you can't just show them, here's a picture of Donald Trump. Tell me a beginning, middle, and end of that story. You're not going to find out anything about them other than their political ideology. If, however, you show them an ambiguous picture of a person whose face looks confused or anguished or uh, troubled, and they have to make up a story about that person, then their stories really don't become about that person. They, they come out of that that individual and tell the story about themselves. The thematic apperception test is, I think it's a series of 10 cards and uh, it's a really good way to start conversation. And that conversation, if people are struggling emotionally, if they're struggling psych psychologically, then these cards can be a place where they can project themselves onto through story, that's the thematic part. Uh, and it's a really good way to get around the defenses people have about talking about themselves or expressing how they really do view the world. Then we can get to the Rorschach, the classic inkblot test, right? So Rorschach is... A All right, so we're going to continue talking about the Rorschach inkblot test, which was designed by uh, the eponymous uh, Hermann Rorschach, a Swiss pseudo-psychologist, who really basically took ink put it on a piece of paper, fold it in half, and then pulled it back. So it made two halves of a paper that were symmetrical. And it was, sorry, my dog is chasing the cat now. <laughs> this is the feral cat. He's not, um, he's, he's not very nice. He'll bite you. Um, Dougie, come here. Come on, come on, come here, come on, help up, come here. This is the good dog. She's a good pup. They have very different personalities. Uh, so even animals have personalities. But back to the Rorschach test. What a good doggy. There were problems with the Rorschach inkblot test in that it was a projective assessment of people's personalities. But then there was a double projection where the person who was reading what people said about the Rorschach, they're projecting themselves onto the patients who are taking this particular test. So there needed to be a standardized system for scoring. The issue with that was solved basically by a standardization of a system um, in the 1960s by Exner. That's the system I learned to use in that huge spiral bound notebook. And it was a very uh, tedious thing to learn, but it's also nice to have a uh, a system by which you could rely on knowing what other people would grade these particular responses as the same way that you would grade them. And so if there's a standardization, you can have some conversation about objective versions of people's personalities. And that's the thing that really is fraught in personality testing is the lack of standardization. Uh, if, if I show you an inkblot and I say, what might this be, which is the, this, that's the way you're supposed to give a personality test of the Rorschach to people, then I record your responses verbatim. I write down everything you say and I ask you follow-up questions about it. So in that sense, there's a standardized way of administering the test. There are a standard set of cards, but really the cards are supposed to be just, it's just ink in random assortments. Some of them have colored splotches of ink. Um, but again, it's just what in, in woodworking, we call that book match so that it's not exactly the same on each side, but it's almost exactly the same on each side. 
when somebody looks at that, it's just a, a total randomness of an inkblot, and yet, and yet, with Exner's scoring system and responses and the standardization, we find that there is a general way in which people talk about those, those 10 inkblots. There's the wolf, right? There's the, the, there's humanoid pictures. There are standard responses that people will say. People don't come up with randomness. They come up with very consistent things to say about these ink blots, which says something about humans in our perception and our creativity in general, right? We're not very creative. We're all kind of standard, average, normal. We like to think of ourselves as these like special people. We're not, you're all average. Now get over it and get on with your life. Find some meaning and do some good work. That's just who we are. Uh, none of us are special. Uh, in fact, so few of us are special that we don't really need to worry about it. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, Rorschach. So you give people 10 cards, you have them tell you what this might be, you ask them follow-up questions about where they see the particular things, and then you score it on Exer Exner's scoring system, and it comes up with sort of a personality profile for people. That test I don't find very clinically useful. Like I said, I don't know people that use it. It kind of fell out of favor. Um, it's a little bit snake oily, witchcrafty, culty sort of mysticism rather than what psychology is really striving to be, which is a scientifically rigorous system. So there are also projective drawing tests where you can have, um, this is especially useful for kids who linguistically might not be sophisticated enough to be expressing what they're feeling or what they've experienced or what they need to uh, let out um, or what experiencing life is like for them. And so uh, really well-oriented clinicians might have them draw examples of families or houses or a child and that, that's ways to sort of get at personality characteristics that we have kind of hidden from ourselves based on those ego defense mechanisms. All right, the next thing we'll talk about is the ocean. It's an acronym. We're not actually talking about the ocean. We'll talk about the big five personality characteristics. <clears throat> okay, so we've gone through the O of openness. Now we're to the C of conscientiousness. Conscientiousness, for lack of a better term, is like how organized are you? You know, we use this term OCD, but that's totally overused. OCD is an actual psychological disorder that refers to people who have real problems where they can't pursue their life because they have to obsessively do behaviors over and over again. But conscientiousness is a personality characteristic, and you've probably seen this. There are people whose desks or rooms look more organized than yours. Conscientiousness is a natural characteristic of people, and if you are high in conscientiousness, that means that you're probably a reliable person who gets places on time and is prepared for stuff. If you're low in conscientiousness, it probably means that you're spontaneous or less organized or less reliable. Doesn't mean that you're not a hard worker or a great person, it just means that that's not the way you see the world or organize the world for yourself. Uh, low conscientiousness people are very difficult for high conscientiousness people to deal with. And if you are a high conscientiousness person, uh, you know this frustration. If you're a low conscientiousness person, you have no idea why they're so uptight because you didn't put the thing back where it should go. Now, I have elements of both low and high conscientiousness. I don't need that much order, but uh, things do need to be in their place. Uh, in my estimation. So if you if you measure me on a personality test, I took a, there's a cheap personality test, uh, cheap in that you don't need to go to a psychologist to take it, you can take it online, I think it's like five bucks, and it gives you these percentile ranks of uh, what you are uh, in, on the big five personality index, and then it splits it out a little more. You answer a bunch of questions, but it's not that 500 question one of the MMPI. And so I took this test, it's, um, understandmyself.com or something like that on my understand yourself or understand myself I don't remember anyway it's a pretty good one and it rates you on these scales and so I rated on conscientiousness I'm in like the 70th percentile it's not too high but it's high 
Something that's really interesting is that people who are extremely conscientious and, and are high on the conscientiousness scale, they end up doing extremely well in life. They're really good at school, they're really good in business, they're really good in relationships because they again are conscientious. People who are, uh, you know, we think it's romantic to be spontaneous, but real, a long-term committed relationship, you're gonna need somebody who's reliable, not somebody who's lazy or unreliable or, you know, spontaneous, like, I'm just going where I wanna go. I'm not gonna go where you wanna go. So conscientiousness is, a, is, very, is one of the best predictors of overall life success. Uh, if you are really high in that, if you're in the 95th percentile, you can predict pretty good things for yourself because that personality characteristic translates into so much success in every human endeavor. That is conscientiousness. Yeah. It's, it's, it's your attention to detail is another way of saying it. It's, you know, for example, I struggle with organizing these videos. I struggle because the way I used to do lecture is I just go in and I'm like, hey class, what topic are we talking about today? And then I just talk to you for an hour and a half. That's what I used to do and now I'm having to specifically organize each of these lectures and edit these videos and, and it's not up my alley. That's, where, that's not the part of conscientiousness that I, that I really like. Even in my woodworking, I am less detail oriented than those excellent woodworkers you see on YouTube. I make mistakes, there are errors in what I do, and it doesn't bother me. But those people who, uh, you might say, have a perfectionists, right? That's, that's a negative connotation, but really people who are perfectionists are high in conscientiousness and have great attention to detail. And it's great because then their work looks amazing and it's excellent work. Uh, it might be interpersonally difficult for them if they have these unrealistic expectations or they spend 90% of their time for 2% better product maybe that's a lack of efficiency in their life. So it's not like being conscientious is always better or being not conscientious is always worse. There are practical implications to both settings. All right, so that is conscientiousness. The next one in the ocean, openness, neuroticism, I'm sorry, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion. So extroversion is this idea about well, it's controversial, okay? So there's there's two ways of looking at extroversion. One could be this, this classic sort of colloquial way of looking at it, which I, I don't think most personality text, tests actually look for. It's like, hey, do you love going to parties? Do you love to go to music festivals? And, you know, um, do you enjoy eating at a buffet? You know, like things that are all about sort of your sociability. Your sociability isn't necessarily what extroversion or introversion are, but extroversion has more to do with where do you gain your psychic energy? Now, what do I mean psychic energy? I don't mean like you're some sort of a telepath who can lift rocks with your mind. What I mean is the energy you have to do cognitive things, where do you get it from? Do you get it from being with groups of people or do you get it from being by yourself? I, I love my job as a teacher. I, it was so much fun for me to interact with college students. I relish it. I miss it. I wish I was there with you at our college, in the classroom, talking, learning together, exploring ideas, getting to know each other. I love that. But it's extremely draining for me. I go to work, get there at 8 in the morning, there till like 3-ish take off, I go home and I'm exhausted because my psychic energy is gained through being by myself, through isolation, through being a loner. Now you wouldn't think that because you think, oh, you know, everybody thinks I'm very gregarious and outgoing and, and I am, that, that's something that I've learned to be from a sociability standpoint, but the reality is I gain my energy in isolation. I gain energy, it feels good to me, it feels like I'm filling up my ability to do psychic things. Again, not move things with my mind or talk to animals, but it, it my ability to think, the, the fuel for my thinking engine is replenished by myself. That's what Jung meant, Carl Gustav Jung, C.G. Jung, when 
he was talking about extroversion, introversion. I am an outgoing, friendly, loud person. I'm talking it. I'm talkative and I'm affectionate. Those are words that the book talks about as being extroverted. But all of that work drains me. All of that activity lowers my energy level. When I go out and I sit and I look at the river and I'm by myself or it's just my dog or maybe just, maybe just my family on a walk, just a small group of people, you know, five people or less, I'm filled, I'm rejuvenated. So extroversion, introversion isn't just social gregariousness, isn't just this sort of, you love going to parties. I don't like parties. I know that sounds, I'll tell you another secret. I don't like the Beatles. I don't think they're very good. I don't like their music. I, I know that they're influential. I know they're important. I respect the Beatles for their contribution. I just don't like their music. You might hate me for that. People might not understand, especially extrovert people might not understand, I don't like parties because they're extremely draining for me. You know how when you go on a run, you go, you go out there and you, you jog. I see people jogging here on the levee every day. I know that they're hurting right now. It's taking energy out of them. They're burning muscles. But I also relish, I know when they're done with their jog, because when you get done with your jog, you get this high. You get this runner's high, an endorphin rush. Yeah, I, I don't get that at parties. I don't get that rush. I lose energy the entire time I'm at a party. I was known sometimes in college to just dip, just just bounce. I was out because uh, I, I ran out of energy. So I would just leave. It wasn't that I didn't like people. I like people. It's that I ran out of psychic energy to engage. So yeah, that don't think that when you see somebody who's very friendly or outgoing, that automatically means they're extroverted. It doesn't. That's in fact a misnomer. If you understand extroversion, it's where do you gain your energy from? My wife, on the other hand, you might meet her and she is uh, initially upon meeting people, she tends to be more quiet and less outgoing and less gregarious. That's good, it's good to have both potentialities, right? Both me, this clown of a guy that runs around and glad hands everybody and kisses babies and then the more subtle and nuanced and uh, calm sort of person like my wife. But get her at a party and that lady gets lots of energy. She gets excited by the party. She gains energy with people. And yet, you would see her and you go, oh, she's a total introvert, she's shy. No, she is an extrovert. And again, it's this misnomer of understanding what it means to be extroverted or introverted. It doesn't mean shy or outgoing. It means, where do you gain your psychic energy? And clearly, you can be shy and gain your psychic energy from people and groups of people. Um, she loves parties, so that's, there you go. You have two people that have contrasting personality characteristics that get misunderstood if you don't actually know what extroversion is. All right, that's extroversion. Okay, we're talking about agreeableness now. So for Ocean, it's the openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and now agreeableness. So agreeableness is uh, a trait of personality that says, how easygoing are you? How trusting or helpful or um, soft are you? Versus how contrarian are you? How harsh are you? How rude or uncooperative are you? Those sound bad, but it's uh, really important that we have diversity of agreeableness in personalities and groups of people, right? We need to have people that are trusting. We need to have people that don't trust uh, because that allows for um, some discernment in who's trustworthy or trustworthiness. When I took that test, the understanding myself I forget what it is. The test online, and I think it's understandmyself.org. I'll look it up. I'll find it for you. 
And when I took that test, they give you the percentile rank that you are. I told you that I was 79 in uh, openness, uh, in conscientiousness, I was like 70th. Uh, in extroversion, I'm actually introverted. So I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the 40th percentile of extroversion. That means I'm, I'm lower in extroversion than most people. My percentile rank for agreeableness was zero. Now, the the readout of the of the test when you you pay the five dollars you answer these you know hundred questions or something and then you get this percentile rank how you rank compared to every other person who took that test right it's a this sort of self standardizing test in an online sense it's a neat thing about online testing we can do. Zeroth percentile rank. So I told you before when I was, if you got 50th percentile, that means half the people scored less than you on that particular item in personality trait. Half the people scored higher than you or had more extreme of that trait. Half people had less extreme of that trait. I scored the zeroth percentile rank on agreeableness. My first reaction was, these stupid researchers don't know percentile rank. There can't be a zeroth percentile based on a statistical understanding of what percentile rank means. That means the number of people you have less than. And, and it's, it's just, you, there's no zeroth percentile. There's a first percentile. There's a 0 0.001 percentile. There's a 0 0.000001 percentile rank. There is no zeroth percentile rank. And right in the middle of this cognitive experience I had about telling the people who had made this, the researchers who had made this test, the personality researchers who had made this test to discern agreeableness as a personality trait, I'm sitting there ripping them a new one about how wrong they are. And I realized, oh, I, I might be the zeroth percentile in agreeableness. This, they may have just nailed me, just completely got me. What it means is, and, and, and it says this in, in their, their printout of their test, it says, in a room of a hundred people, people, you have the lowest score of agreeableness on, on, of any of these people. You're the least agreeable person, right? That's the I, simplification of a percentile rank. And, you know, it's, it's tough to take because you think, well, agreeableness is a good thing. We should be agreeable. But as I gained insight into my own life, into my own personality, it's helpful to understand we all have a part to play. Our, the diversity of our personalities are a good thing and we benefit from having variability there. And it's good that there's somebody who's as, as extreme as I am um, with agreeableness because I will always be the one to call a question. I will always be the one to be skeptical. I will always be the one who's willing to say, maybe that's not right. Maybe the party line is wrong. You know, I, I remember from a very early age, I was this way. And I'm pretty sure if you ask my parents, they would say even earlier than I remember, I had this contentious, skeptical personality trait that is my zeroth percentile agreeableness. To be disagreeable is not the same thing as having low agreeableness. Um, I, I know there are times and social situations where I have to check my own nature, my trait of personality that is disagreeable and just let it go. Those are times when I have social obligations to people. Uh, but if left to my own nature, let's say I'm, let's say I'm online. Let's say it's somebody I don't know that says something. Uh, it can be very difficult to then not be the contrarian. And it doesn't help. It's not a helpful trait. But I, I will say this. Um, there's a story about um, the, the Israeli intelligence service, the Mossad, and the, the Israeli intelligence officers back back when they were almost driven into the sea by uh, a group of Arab nations who were fighting the Israelis um, for control over the land that they are in. They 
saw all the troops amassing on the borders, right? On, on their southern border, on their eastern border, on their northeastern border. They saw all these troops. They had the intelligence, but the, all, the intelligence officer said, you know, it just so happens that Syria and Jordan and Egypt are all just training on our border with their military tanks and troops at the same time. It just so happens that way. And everybody in their intelligence service all said the same thing. They were all too agreeable. Um, after that happened, it became a cultural thing in the Mossad that they would disagree with one another as a function of their duty. That if there were 10 officers in a room and everybody says, this, is a th this isn't a threat, 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 this isn't a threat. The 10th officer to respond must say, regardless of whether or not they believe that it's a threat, they must say this is a threat. And what that does is it allows for, as you'll see when we get to social psychology, the dissenting voice allows for you to not get caught up in social movements, in groupthink. And um, there can be some very bad consequences of that. Like Israel, from their perspective, almost got wiped off the map because they weren't skeptical enough um, that there were too many yes men in the room and there wasn't somebody who, like me, is totally disagreeable and says, no, that's wrong. So see, even though it's a very extreme personality characteristic, there are places where it is useful. There are also places where it is very unuseful and it's very distracting and troubling. So uh, that is agreeableness. All right. Okay, the last one of our ocean, the openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness. The last one is neuroticism. Neuroticism sounds bad just from the get-go, right? When you say, how neurotic are you? Um, it's important to recognize that we're all a little neurotic. There are all little things about us that are neurotic, which means that we don't take everything fully rationally, that we have some sort of irrational fears. We do some things that are a little emotionally overblown. That's true for everybody. Everybody's got a little bit of neuroticism. If neuroticism goes way haywire, uh, it becomes almost a psychotic state. If it goes no neuroticism, you almost get to a robotic state. So psychotic or robotic. Um, neuroticism is really sort of how calm are you? When, when the proverbial hits the fan, are you somebody who freaks out and is anxious and worried and, and tepid and you're, you're just out of control? Or are you somebody who is calm, collected, composed? High neuroticism means that you're going to be very, very susceptible to any anxieties, any of the worries and the depressions, right? The sort of things that get you down in life. Whereas if you're very low in neuroticism, you might not be even sensitive enough to the situation, right? So it could be a bad thing. It's not just that you're not anxious and not depressed, it's that you're not even feeling. So that's one part of neuroticism. Um, again, it's good to have diversity of people, people that are the alerters and the uh, people that are experiencing the high levels of emotions, the neurotics. And it's important to have those people who are the robotics, right? The, the ones that are Calm, cool, collected, not at all worried. Both people are good. It's good to have diversity of personality. Um, my neuroticism's pretty much average. I'm like 50th percentile neuroticism. I'm like normal, normal neurotic. I mean, sometimes I'm worried, sometimes I'm calm. Um, it, it's interesting though. You know, the, that's how my my it plays out on on a test that I take and answer questions. But I would say it's more nuanced. My neuroticism is different than that. You know, I, I had experiences working in hospitals. I had experiences working in high stress surgery situations where I'm talking to patients who have their brains open. I can get on one side of the surgical curtain and see their gray matter. On the other side, I'm talking to them and testing them with cognitive tests. I was always fine in those situations. It wasn't a problem for me. But I did recognize that again, part of that combination of my introversion and neuroticism 
I can totally act the part cool for a certain period of time, but then there's gonna be a place where I'm gonna break down. And my wife pointed that out to me. I can be absolutely 100% good in a, in a difficult, stressful, dangerous situation. I'll take control, I'm steady Eddie, I'm stable, able, but as soon as that dangerous threat or, or anxiety ridden situations over and everything's safe and calm, I break down emotionally, right? So it seems like I'm 50th percentile for neuroticism, but yet elements of me are experiencing this highness and this lowness. The context brings out that particular behavior. And so again, I want you to look at this as not like you're stuck. You're not a number. You're a complex creature who has proclivities and it's interesting to look at personality assessments and to see where you stand next to other people, but then take into account other people's perspectives on you, right? Like my wife's perspective on how I can be very stable during a crisis, but then right after that crisis is, is over, I break down. That's a really interesting thing because the, the test only sees me as, as, you know, 50th percentile. It doesn't see me as actually ranging that level of neuroticism which I do depending on the context, right? So these projective assessments of personality, these standardized ones, the MMPIs, the Rorschachs, they're good, they have uses, but really people who know you are gonna be the best assessment of your own personality and they can help you understand yourself and more about how you're gonna to react to certain situations in certain places. All right, to review, openness, how open are you to new ideas? Conscientiousness. How well organized are you? Attention to detail. Okay. Extroversion. How much do you gain your cognitive energy, your ability to do thinking work from the group or the crowd? Or how much does it drain you? Uh, agreeableness. How um, easygoing, placid, uh, or how critiquing or skeptical are you? Neuroticism is how susceptible to anxieties and depressions, how, how, how emotional do you get when there are stressful situations? Those are the big five personality um, traits.